The next item of business is a debate on motion 9221 in the name of Murdo Fraser on Barclay Review and Arms Length External Organisations. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move the motion for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. I think it's fair to say this is going to be a rather different debate from the one we were expecting when we put down the subject for discussion last week. I was expecting to come along and uh, demand that the Cabinet Secretary axe the swim tax, and he has, of course, beaten me to it. Uh, now, being, a, uh, being a, a generous soul, uh, can I thank the uh, Finance Secretary for uh, announcing uh, yesterday uh, that this proposal to remove the uh, rates relief uh, from local authority arm's length organisations Alios will not now to proceed, for uh, I think we have to accept bowing to the inevitable. And uh, I'm sure the timing of that announcement yesterday was purely coincidental <laughs> in terms of the fact that this debate was taking place uh, this afternoon. So can I, can I be generous in my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for his U-turn? Can I thank the other opposition parties in this chamber for their cooperation and for indicating they were prepared to work with us uh, and show a united front. And can I thank, most of all, my Conservative colleagues for leading the charge against the swim tax and delivering a significant <laughs> victory, a significant victory for this Parliament, for the opposition parties, and most of all, for the Scottish Conservatives. Now, presiding officer, <laughs> just two weeks ago, there was a members' debate in this chamber in the name of my colleague, Gordon Lindhurst, on this question of the Barclay Review, and specifically this recommendation that the current charitable exemption from paying non-domestic rates for local authority arm's length organisations should be uh, removed. And I don't intend to rehearse all the arguments in that debate, but I think it's just worth reminding us how uh, we got here. Uh, and I'd like to, to reassure members before I go any further, particularly Bruce Crawford, who I know has got a strong personal interest in this matter, that I will not, not be modelling a pair of Speedos during this debate. I'm sure that will come as a great disappointment to Mr Crawford and other members. I can't speak for Mr Lindhurst, I have to say, but I will not be modelling speedos in this debate. Now, the background to this issue was the Barclay Review of Business Rates, which was a comprehensive summary uh, of the issues, although hamstrung from the very start by the Finance Secretary's requirement that his recommendation was, would have to be revenue neutral. And what the Barclay Review did was it characterised arm's length organisations, including those providing leisure, and cultural facilities as tax avoidance structures. And while this is, or may be, technically correct, I think this language actually was unhelpful, particularly in the context of what we've heard uh, in recent weeks about the Paradise Papers. I was, incidentally, Deputy Presiding Officer, interested to hear the Finance Secretary say in that debate uh, that on uh, this issue uh, that tax avoidance might not be a bad thing. But I'm sure he'll want to reassure me that he was only referring to those limited circumstances rather than a more general issue. And of course I'll give way. Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, my purpose in life is to reassure Murdo Fraser. <laughs> and I'm happy to reassure him. Of course there's a world of difference in tax avoidance where people take money for profit to squirrel it away and the description of alios who take the tax that is avoided as a construct of their corporate governance to reinvest. And public services. Martin Fraser. I'm very grateful to the Finance Secretary for, for, for giving me that reassurance and putting that on the record. I was interested to, to read some of his comments yesterday about uh, what might happen going forward and perhaps he can clarify this when he comes to his contribution about local authorities which do not currently have alios but might be considering setting them up. Yes of course I'll give way. Yeah. Derek Mackay. A helpful intervention because I'll be summing up and of course it'll be interesting to hear the views of other members on this point. I recommend that current alios in their trust status have their uh, relief maintained but I made a point in previous debates that there is a risk to future uh, services and therefore we should draw a line as to no new services being transferred uh, into that uh, category and that was my position. Murdo Fraser. The Cabinet Secretary for, for clarifying that matter. I, I know it will be of interest to some local authorities in different parts of Scotland who I'm sure will want to, to raise that. But this proposal about uh, charging rates and alios did meet a great deal of objection from across uh, the country. Robin Strang, the Chair of Sport of Scotland, and Anthony McRavey, the Chair of Vocal Scotland, respectively the membership bodies for cultural and leisure trusts in Scotland, 
and the National Association for Culture and Leisure Managers wrote, wrote jointly to committees of this parliament expressing their concerns, saying that they believed that the implementation of this recommendation would result in, and I quote, a catastrophic and irreversible impact on the provision of community-valued leisure, parks and culture across Scotland. So they were very clear about the impact that these would have. And it seems particularly strange to be doing this at a time when what we're trying to do is encourage more uh, activity, uh, tackling obesity, going to get more people uh, uh, being involved in sports and leisure, and when our cultural output is vital to our economic and tourism offer. So I'm glad uh, that the uh, Cabinet Secretary has responded to a vigorous uh, Conservative uh, campaign. Now, we've had this climb down uh, from the Scottish uh, Government, and in a spirit of generosity, can I say we'll be happy to accept the Scottish Government's amendment to our motion uh, this afternoon. And finally, Presiding Officer, can I just reflect that it was after mature debate and consideration that the Scottish Government withdrew these particular tax proposals. We, of course, are currently having another mature debate and consideration about levels of income tax. I can only hope that the mature debate around income tax will lead the Cabinet Secretary to the same conclusion that he reached on the swim tax, and we will see that tax axed as well. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to move the motion in my name. I now call Aileen Campbell to speak to and move amendment 9221.4 in the name of Derek Mackay for up to five minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And from the outset, the Scottish Government said it would consider the 30 recommendations from the Barclay Review, which was a mix of support measures and revenue raising. They were presented as supporting growth, improving administration and increasing fairness. It was also acknowledged that none of this would be easy. Kenneth Barclay estimated ending charity relief from council alios would generate 45 million, its biggest revenue raising recommendation. And during his statement on the 12th of September, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance accepted the vast majority of the recommendations, including a range of measures to support growth and investment that have been widely welcomed by business. The Barclay Review aimed to ensure non-domestic rate supports growth and reflects economic conditions. And on alios, it suggested that in particular leisure trust, has an unfair competitive advantage over privately operated gyms. The Cabinet Secretary undertook to fully engage and listen to those impacted by his, the, these recommendations. He did this, he reflected on what he was presented with and made yesterday's positive announcement. Presiding officer, this government will go to great lengths to protect the Scottish public from yeah. seeing Murdo Fraser in speedos. <laughs> Derek Mackay announced that qualifying properties currently occupied by Alios will continue to benefit from charity relief from non-domestic rates. And as we've heard, this includes many well-used leisure and cultural venues across the country. The Scottish Government will take steps to offset the charity relief benefits to councils from any new alio expansion in the future. Presiding Officer, I want to take the opportunity, though, to put on record our appreciation for excellent work which sport and leisure trusts and cultural venues do right across the country, along with the local authorities who manage the services eh, themselves. Colin Smith. On the issue of offsetting any further charity relief benefit to councils to deter future alios, will that mean that councils uh, who still have every one of their sport and leisure facilities in-house will receive compensation for the full rates for those sports and leisure facilities? Because if not, that doesn't deter them from creating an alio in the future. Well, as I said, you know, what we want, the, the Cabinet Secretary outlined in his statement yesterday that he wanted to uh, offset any further charity relief benefits to councils to deter future alio expansion. And the Cabinet Secretary also continues to engage with COSLA on many of those issues. I'm sure, again, we'll uh, continue to pick yeah. up those points uh, through the rest of the debate. But going back to putting on record our thanks to the work uh, of Sport and Leisure Trust, I also want to thank all those who have taken part in the consultation process from my portfolio, Sport and Vocal, who worked with their partners to provide us with the information required as government reflected on what Barclay rec recommended. Their research suggests that 92% of all trusts confirmed that they would be forced to close leisure centres and swimming pools, and 65% stated that community facilities such as town halls and village halls and community centres could face a similar fate. Similarly, cultural organisations outlined a pretty bleak future for the facilities that provide much needed and enriching cultural offerings, including museums, galleries and libraries. And it's important to remember that these facilities are more than just potential revenue streams. They are community assets, providing places to meet, to be active, to play, learn and enjoy a host of pursuits. 
And in my role as Minister for Public Health and Sport, as constituency member for Clydesdale, and also as a mother who takes her two wee boys to the local leisure centre, regardless of where it is, it has been my privilege to visit a number of leisure trusts and to hear about the work they do. Work that often goes above and beyond simply being a sports centre and aligns with this government's priority to get people more active more often and, un and tackling unfair inequalities. From swimming classes for disabled children or strength and balance work for the elderly to dementia friendly exercise classes, Leisure Trust provide a variety of services, often benefiting the hardest to reach in society. However, I've always been clear to Leisure Trust to better evidence the impact that they are having in their local communities. And although government has rejected this recommendation, that doesn't mean we can be complacent or simply continue as we have. We must collectively work to articulate with robust evidence exactly what these communi community facilities bring and what further potential they still have. Presiding officer, we are very familiar with the arguments of the need to nudge our population towards being active. And we're also familiar with the stats showing that physical inactivity results in around 2,500 premature deaths, costs the NHS around 94.1 million annually and can have a significant impact on over 25 chronic conditions. Leisure Trust can and some already do position themselves firmly in that preventative health space. Here they can clearly differentiate themselves from other leisure providers. They have opportunities to collaborate with the NHS, local authorities and third sector colleagues in the delivery of health and social care services. The power of this potential, if done in a consistent way, is huge. And they, often ha they also have opportunity to support local groups and not fear they are in competition with them. And there's also surely scope to collaborate across their territorial boundaries in the pursuit of maximise the uh, impact of this significant uh, resource. Now, yesterday afternoon, I spoke with Sporta and Vocal, who are rightly proud about what their neighbour members achieve. And again, there is also great scope for us to continue working in partnership, along with uh, my colleague Derek Mackay and others, to seize this chance to get the most out of this considerable resource that should be maximised so the benefits can all, from all, for all can be felt. And I look forward to hearing the contributions from across the chamber. I call James Kelly. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It does give me pleasure to speak in this afternoon's debate on the Barclay Review and Alios. Um, as Murdo Fraser said, it's perhaps a very different debate from the one that we expected uh, a little over 24 hours ago. Um, and, you know, much as the government talk about the consideration they've given this and the consultation, etc., etc., the reality of this is that 24 hours ago, the government faced the prospect of a defeat on this issue uh, with the opposition parties uniting to vote down the government at five o'clock. And that was why uh, Mr Mackay rushed out his press release uh, yesterday afternoon in order to avoid that defeat. And, <laughs> and, and, it, and it does. With evidence to support <laughs> it. Come on. And, and if I need uh, any more evidence, you know, uh, usually in these finance debates, we see Mr Mackay leading the charge for the government from the front. But bearing in mind, this is a concession. Just let me finish this point, Mr Mackay. This is a concession that he's been dragged to make. Uh, he's put, he's put uh, the valiant Aileen Campbell up to front the debate this afternoon. I, I can't allow any extra time, Mr Kelly. Derek I thank James Kelly for taking that intervention. I think it's quite appropriate that the responsible minister for this area, including sport and such organisations, actually makes this contribution to the chamber. And amongst ministerial views, it, rather than Murdo Fraser, it was Aileen Campbell who was representing the sector, ensuring this was a decision that the government took. So that's all the more reason that Aileen Campbell contributed to this debate. James Kelly. M much as you try, Mr Mackay, that doesn't sound very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested... I mean, I was interested to hear Aileen Campbell talk about the consultation, and I'm really surprised that the government felt the need, you know, to consult on this recommendation, because clearly it's a logical follow-on from this, that uh, if these... Uh, you know, sporting uh, venues within the various council areas were going to have to pay business rates. It would lead to the closure of many. And that would have a de not only have a detrimental effect on local communities, uh, which see these sporting facilities as the lifeblood of, the, uh, of their local area, uh, it would also significantly reduce participation rates. And that's something that Aileen Campbell talks about 
you know, quite consistently as sports minister. I mean, in the, the health questions this afternoon, there was quite a vigorous debate about funding for the Scottish Sports Association, and it showed how much uh, members feel tr strongly about funding sport, and that would have been uh, severely undermined if this decision uh, had gone ahead. So from that point of view, uh, I welcome the, the government's U-turn. I think it's also uh, essential to look at the, still to look at the overall funding package in terms of what will be raised, raised through non-domestic rates, because £2.8 billion uh, is the figure which obviously contributes towards local authority budgets. And uh, whereas this is a complex area and it's important to get the, the solutions uh, correct and transparent, it's absolutely essential that it's cost neutral and it doesn't result in reductions to the, the overall local government settlement. So I think in terms of moving forward, although it's welcome we've got a U-turn and that will be welcomed by many councils, uh, there are consequential issues that have got to be examined that Colin Smith and others have raised around uh, 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 council sporting facilities which uh, are not alios and the clear issue of the local government settlement cannot be undermined as a result of this. We now move to the open debate. Strict four minute speeches, please. Andy Whiteman, followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Murdo Fraser for bringing this debate and thank those who provided briefings uh, as well. As I said during Gordon Linter's debate last week, uh, the way we have historically developed policy on domestic rates has been often ad hoc and opportunistic. But the system of non-domestic rates itself is based on sound principles. The Cabinet Secretary and his predecessor is fond of citing Adam Smith's four maxims of taxation, one of which is the equality or proportionality of the ability to pay. But what Scottish ministers never do is to complete the maxim, which in full reads, the subjects of every state ought to contribute towards the support of the government as nearly as possible in proportion to their respective abilities. That is, in proportion to the revenue which they respectively enjoy under the protection of the state. Now, when Adam Smith wrote that maxim, income tax didn't exist, it was yet to be invented. Uh, and the revenue he referred to was the revenue arising from the economic rent of land. So today, almost a quarter of a century later, the non-domestic rating system continues to capture or socialize that economic uh, rent. And on the question of charitable relief for arm's length organizations, as I said in the previous debate, I am not persuaded that there is a case for withdrawal of this relief, and such a case as might exist should only follow a full impact assessment. So we welcome the government's announcement uh, yesterday, uh, but we regret a little bit that a system that, as I say, is already complex and dealt with in an ad hoc fashion is to have further ad hoc uh, provisions attached to it in relationship to Derek Mackay's, Mackay's proposals about future uh, alios, which will add more complexity. Now, the fact that this proposal was even under consideration is because of the peculiar manner in which the Barclay Review was framed. In September 2013, uh, Derek Mackay, who was then Minister for Local Government, published a response to the consultation supporting business promoting growth, in which he said that during the Scottish, in which he said that the Scottish Government would conduct, and I quote, a thorough and comprehensive review of the whole business rate system by 2017, which would deliver a fair, simpler and more efficient business rate system. That review never took place. Instead, we had the Barclay Review, which asked only one question. How would you redesign the business rate system to better support business and incentivize investment? It was also instructed that its recommendation should be revenue neutral. And that meant in practice that any proposals that were made to reduce liabilities in any way had to be balanced by measures that would make up for that lost yield. Barclay was not the comprehensive review promised in 2013 that has yet to take place. And it was the narrow context in which Barclay took um, uh, uh, took place that the idea under debate, here, to take, under debate here today emerged with no proper grounding in taxation principles or of the legitimate debate to be had on charitable relief and other reliefs. Presiding officer, I have long argued that charitable relief is a blunt instrument, as is the small business bonus scheme, uh, which as I reported, for example, some weeks ago results in many short-term lets in Edinburgh, avoiding six million pounds in tax liabilities. And it's high time we had a proper debate on the system of local taxation and how to make it fairer, more transparent and locally accountable. Greens advocate a system of land value tax, which would mean there would be no tax liability on improvements, but a levy solely on land values. Given the current state of the housing crisis, and my colleagues and I recently calculated that there are thousands of hectares 
of derelict and vacant land, some of which is held in offshore tax havens, but which pays not a penny to local services. We believe that councils should be provided and could be provided with powers to tax, for example, the capital gains of main residences. We could scrap land and buildings transaction tax. We could revalue domestic property. We could do much, much more. But every hour spent debating ad hoc proposals arising out of flawed reviews is, in my view, an hour wasted when we should and could be turning our efforts to far more fundamental reform. The last of the open debate speakers is Tavish Scott. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I begin this uh, debate by suggesting that Murdo Fraser should apologise to Derek Mackay, because there was poor Mr Mackay trying to think of one or two cheerful bits of news for the budget in two weeks' time, and there he alighted on the obvious thing to do, which was to take away the, uh, uh, this threat hanging over our sports clubs and many other organisations across Scotland. Uh, and what happened, the Tories put down a motion, which the rest of us were going to support, and there was Derek's opportunity for glory in two weeks' time sweeped away, swept away from him. So I think we should start this debate by Mr Fraser apologising to Mr Mackay for that, for that uh, disgraceful bit of political grandstanding. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an important uh, outcome for, uh, this is an important outcome for uh, the sports clubs, for the leisure facilities and many other organisations across Scotland who would have been uh, in some big financial hole were this measure to have uh, uh, been allowed to happen, for this rates relief to have been removed. And it's uh, in that spirit that I think we should take this debate forward uh, today. They made uh, a careful and considered case, both to government and also to the opposition parties, about the importance of the organisations of a wider policy in part of, of any decision to remove uh, rates relief. And they did it in a way I think that was uh, important for, from a number of perspectives. Uh, one of which in my part of the world was on competition, because Barclay uh, considered that uh, where uh, such facilities were competing with the uh, private sector, uh, then there should be uh, a change uh, in respect of those uh, sports clubs and others uh, who were, as he saw it, competing. Well, that doesn't exist in Shetland. It doesn't exist in many parts of rural Scotland. It may exist in, in some of our cities, although there are, well, it does exist in some of our cities, but there are different arguments there, as, as were made clear in Gordon Lindhurst's debate uh, a week or so uh, ago. Uh, so I am pleased that the uh, Cabinet Secretary recognised that point uh, and made uh, that change. There is one other aspect he made, in response to uh, Murdo Fraser's remarks earlier on, he made um, uh, uh, an observation about the definition uh, and what may or may not happen in the future and keeping that under review. I think it's very important when the government do look at this again in, uh, on the uh, use of values by local government uh, that they recognise audit Scotland's uh, definitions in this area uh, because uh, there, is, there is some room there, I think, for sensible arrangements to be made by local government in trying to ensure that uh, the people they serve uh, receive the best service they can through the kinds of organisations that we are uh, protect, uh, protecting here uh, tonight. Uh, two final points, presiding officer. Uh, on Friday night, uh, instead of having a debate in, in the Clickham Leisure Centre in Shetland about uh, how they were going to find £700,000 of savings, instead we will have our annual sports awards. Uh, we are very honoured this year to have Gregor Townsend, the Scottish national rugby coach, joining us as our uh, principal. It would have been Derek Mackay, but we didn't know he was going to make this U-turn, otherwise uh, uh, obviously we'd have had Mr Mackay uh, uh, to, to, to do the honours. Uh, not in speedos, no. Uh, there, there, are, there are some things we will just not put up with in Shetland, uh, and uh, that is certainly one. But uh, instead, uh, I think the important point here is that we have an agreed sports strategy at home in my part of the world, which involves the National Health Service, uh, Sports Scotland, uh, our local council, and our Leisure Facility Trust. Uh, and that ensures that we do, as the government would ask us, uh, to look at participation of healthy lifestyles, of tackling mental ill health across all ages. And that, for me, is at the heart of uh, is at the part of what this debate uh, should be uh, about. So when the sports minister in her opening remarks this evening suggested that collectively we should look at how we can uh, work on these things, uh, I agree. And therefore, perhaps tonight, the test for the Cabinet Secretary on Finance, when the budget is announced in a couple of weeks' time, is to make sure there are no further cuts to the sports budget that we have seen since the Commonwealth Games, and instead that we recognise how important sport is for all these wider government objectives. Uh, we move to, to the closing speeches. I call Jackie Bailey. Can I have um, shorter than four minutes, please? Oh, I shall be quick then. Let me thank the Cabinet Secretary for making this one of the shortest debates in the Parliament. Let me gently observe that when it comes to the Cabinet Secretary, it appears that the mere prospect of losing a vote in this chamber has him on the run. Now, his normal answer for everything is to say that he can't possibly tell you anything until the budget is announced on the 14th of December. Well, clearly he has changed his mind. And I very much welcome this, as he made the right decision yesterday. Now, of course, 
he will say that his announcement had nothing at all to do with today's debate. Of course, we believe him. But whilst I might enjoy teasing the Cabinet Secretary, at the end of the day, the right conclusion has been reached. I will, however, put him on notice because the temptation to bring forward a series of motions that would enjoy majority support in the chamber during the budget is too strong to resist. And I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary responding positively. It is the case that members across the chamber had been contacted by their local leisure trust. I was approached by Western Berkshire Leisure Trust, not in the time available, and Liv Argyle, both genuinely concerned about the impact of paying business rates um, on the services that they provide. And I know that leisure trusts across Scotland were having to face the possibility of closing facilities, price rises, reducing hours, and even making staff redundant. They are both relieved and grateful for the decision made by the Cabinet Secretary to continue their exemption from non-domestic rates. The Cabinet Secretary has, however, been silent on the other recommendations that he believed required further consideration and engagement. So let me ask him, has he reached a view on private schools? Has he reached a view on empty properties? Will he increase the large business supplement again in this budget? And will he tell us now? Rather than tell us exactly now, he can do it in his contribution because the presiding officer has told me I don't have time. But what I suspect he will actually tell us in his closing contribution is that gentle refrain that we always hear, he can't reveal anything until the budget. But he's clearly made a decision on part of the non part of the non-domestic rates package. So why not the rest? Perhaps you should listen to what I'm saying, presiding officer, because it is a package. And I well remember the cabinet secretary saying that the Barclay review would be cost neutral when it started. He repeated that in the chamber on the 6th of September when he made his statement to this parliament. So far, he has announced the giveaways, the good stuff, but he's not told us how he will raise the income to keep it cost neutral. I look forward to his contribution telling us that. Because I want to know, is he proposing that the balancing funding, which must be in excess of £120 million per year, should come from the areas he has still to consider? And if so, wow, is that some burden. But this money matters both to businesses and to organisations that need to plan for increases, but also for local authorities who rely on the income. The Cabinet Secretary needs to tell us if he's going to stick to the outcome of Barclay being revenue neutral or if he is going to forego vital resources and cut local government even further than he is already planning to do. He should tell us in his closing contribution, presiding officer. He might want to continue to hide behind the mantra of all will be revealed in the budget. But I am asking him about a principle. Will the outcome of the Barclay report, when implemented by the Cabinet Secretary, be revenue neutral for this coming financial year, yes or no. Presiding officer, I am always happy to welcome ministerial announcements that give hard-pressed organisations a financial break. Goodness sake, we all do. But it does show an arrogance from the Cabinet Secretary to simply pick and mix what he tells this chamber. SNP and Labour members are rightly pursuing the Tory government about transparency in the EU negotiations. Perhaps he should start closer to home and pr provide transparency to this parliament now. Paul uh, Derek Mackay will see if the Cabinet Secretary knows what shorter than four minutes means. Uh, well, I'll do my best, presiding officer, of course. I'm in your hands. But can I say, first of all, I welcome this constructive, consensual debate where Parliament has united. We have united. And even Jackie Bailey has had to compliment me. That's as close as a compliment as Jackie Bailey gets. But can I say, uh, Minister Aileen Campbell has covered many of the benefits of this uh, decision. In fact, many members have, uh, to be fair. And of course, those interested in the decision have warmly welcomed the decision as well. A key recommendation of Barclay that people across this chamber welcomed was one of the recommendations in the content of the report that if the government is going to make substantive changes on non-domestic rates, it should consult first. We agreed that was an important principle. And that is exactly what I did as finance secretary in the Scottish government. So it's hardly a U-turn of government policy when it was never government policy. It was a recommendation from an independent panel for which we were to consider 
and to deliberate on. Now, I did engage, consult, and consider. And some members have said, why even consult? <laughs> because I've kept within the spirit of the Barclay report to engage uh, in such uh, matters. And Andy Whiteman, with a very thoughtful contribution, it made the point around, if you ever change anything, do an impact assessment. And that's exactly what I've been engaged uh, in. That includes stakeholders, that includes trusts and allios, that includes council, COSLA, and political colleagues as well, such as Bob Doris, who took an interest as a local government convener and asked questions of it. So I've engaged with members, and I listened very closely as well to the members' debate that we had, and I said at that point, if the matter wasn't concluded, but that would feed in to my thinking. So stop, press. Minister listens, engages, and responds constructively and positively. In terms of the, I don't have enough time, I'm afraid, in terms of models of delivery, I listened very closely to what the Greens in particular and the Labour Party said as well around the particular uh, ALIO model. And that's why I've set out a position that we do have to draw a line. Some local authorities were engaging in the concept of putting school gym halls next into their status to avoid paying non-domestic rate. So there are a range of reasons for us to consider at what point it was appropriate to say no further, but also to give stability and continuity uh, going forward in terms of those trusts who are delivering uh, operations uh, right uh, now. Now there's been arguments about who should take credit for this decision. I see Richard Leonard's not in the chamber uh, right uh, now. But of course there has been, I, I don't have time, but I'll try if I've got a minute left. Uh, of course this was about engagement, this was about listening to impact and responding appropriately. But I say joint, gently to the Conservatives, when they speak about sport and culture, are they not aware of the downturn in lottery resources which is impacting in sport and culture organisations across the country and have failed to address that issue? So I have said I was listening and engaging, and that's exactly what we've done. In terms of revenue neutrality, Barclay did have that as a, a remit, but clearly we can look at the totality of resources to arrive at the right decisions around what is the right thing to do in terms of non-domestic rates. But this debate has been quite a mature one, but it has flushed out once again that the opposition, particularly the Tory party, knows how to spend money, but no idea how to raise revenue for our public services. And I say, and I say to everyone in the chamber, and touching on the point that Tavish Scott made, and I, I said I would listen, to everyone in the chamber, I look forward to the budget on the 14th of December, and here's yet another reason to back it. I call Gordon Lindhurst to close this debate. Can you take us to decision time, please, Mr Lindhurst? Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, after the last two speeches, I wasn't sure if peace on earth had come early to Parliament, but uh, the speeches then developed into uh, one or two critical points. Nevertheless, um, I'm not going to enter into the debate between my colleague Murdo Fraser and Derek Mackay earlier on about either speedos or squirrels. Um, it is good to come here and for the government to have uh, listened to the views of both the opposition parties and uh, the alios who would have been affected by this decision and to come here on the back of the members debate that I brought to the parliament. That of course gave the opportunity to members from across the chamber different parties to express their views on the potential consequences for alios if the Barclay recommendation 24 had been implemented. That message was loud and clear. By removing charitable relief from them, devastating cuts could have been inflicted on vital facilities and lifeline services within our communities. So these organizations have sat somewhat uneasy for the past couple of weeks at least, awaiting this decision, which indeed I am sure they welcome as the, we do on these benches. At the heart of the issue as the Barclay, uh, of the Barclay Review, as has been commented on was a misunderstanding about the purpose of these alios and the, the idea that they were involved in tax avoidance in the commonly understood sense. And I think as has been done in the debate, and I think it was a, a good thing to do, to remind ourselves of the services actually delivered by them. 
and in my own region, Edinburgh Leisure, its community access program provides free leisure cards to partner organizations who work with some of the most vulnerable people in society. The goal being to promote positive partnerships, create opportunities for everyone to get active. And that's an example of the sort of program that was potentially under threat by this. And I think we're all agreed that is the sort of program and indeed it chimes with the Scottish Government's policy objectives as stated, which we do all agree with. Uh, another example, West Lothian Leisure, Excite, numerous programs that could have been affected by this, including one which was uh, free swimming, but uh, again, I fear that neither Murdo Fraser nor Derek Mackay could benefit from this, being for those aged over 60 or under five. But for those who do benefit from it, a crucial program to help keep uh, people active and in good health. So all in all, a welcome decision by uh, Derek Mackay on this. And it does mean that rates relief not being removed in this way will mean that, as uh, Robin Strang of Excite in West Lothian said, many thousands of people in our communities uh, will not, to add into his words, lose their only connection to phys physical activity and social inclusion. So, that, again, we're agreed upon. So perhaps in uh, closing, I might ask uh, Derek Mackay whether or not he has any further news on recommendation 27 in the Barclay Review, because this would affect uh, sports clubs, community sports clubs that I've visited in Lothian, and uh, they operate in a not-for-profit way. Again, they provide services not just to those who come to them but also to local state schools provision of um, playing fields free of charge and these would be impacted upon so I'd be interested to hear what his response is on that particular recommendation which I don't think he has yet clarified and no doubt he'll very shortly do so and I conclude with that presiding officer Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate uh, on the Barclay Review and Alios. The next item of business is consideration of five business bureau motions. Motion 9274, setting out a business programme. Motions 9275, 9276, 9277 and 9278 on timetables for four bills. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against any or either of these motions to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the above-mentioned motions. Moved on block. Thank you very much. No member, member has asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 9274 to 9278 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 9281 on approval of an SSI. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Moved. Thank you very much. And we turn now to... Decision time. The first question is that Amendment 9218.4 in the name of Shona Robison, which seeks to amend Motion 9218 in the name of Miles Briggs on general practice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9218.4 in the name of Shona Robinson is yes 58, no 54. There are six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 9218.2 in the name of Colin Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Miles Briggs on general practice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members be cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 9218.2 in the name of Colin Smith is yes 29, no 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 9218 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended on general practice be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9218 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended is yes 63, no 49. There were six abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that, motion, is that amendment 9221.4 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend motion 9221 in the name of Murdo Fraser on the Barclay Review and Alios be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 9221 in the name of Murder Fraser as amended on Barclay Review and Alios be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the next question is that motion 9281 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now before we end decision time and before we move to members business, it's been brought to my attention that uh, one of the members took a photograph of this chamber while we were sitting and tweeted it out. I would just draw attention, my guidance on the Code of Conduct, which was published at the beginning of this session, makes it clear that photographs should not be taken in the chamber. The guidance forms part of the Code of Conduct. The guidance forms part of the Code of Conduct, and I would draw members' attention to their responsibilities under that Code of Conduct. I will be writing to the member concerned, but I hope all members will take that on board. And that concludes decision time. That concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business and we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.